Welcome everyone to the Score Fantasy Football Podcast presented by Subway. I'm your host, Justin Boone, the lead fantasy analyst at The Score, and I am joined by my co-host, David P. Woods, a man who tweeted out some potential 2019 headlines the other day. Uh, Antonio Brown being traded, Leonard Fournette being traded, John Harbaugh being traded. And Woods, you speculated in that tweet. You think one of those could come true this year. Are you still sticking with that? Yeah, I think we'll see one of those. I think Fournette's like the by far the most obvious one to get traded out of that trio. Just, I mean, the the table has been set there with the Jaguars voiding his guarantees and, you know, his rushing uh, yards per carry over the past two seasons has been actually pretty terrible. So I, I think we're setting up for a divorce there and that could easily happen this offseason. I think Brown less likely to be traded. We'll probably talk about that more momentarily. And, you know, coaching trades get reported like as possibilities every offseason I'm not sure we'll ever see one again but if there's going to be one Harbaugh would kind of make sense it would be interesting and I mean there have just been more trades in general the last couple of years so we could see some in the offseason there's a lot to go over on today's episode I know the main fantasy season is done here most of you had your championships in week 16 now we're looking ahead we got some DFS during the playoffs And we want to look ahead to 2019. At this point in the year, that's when you should get your prep in January, February. What you do now is going to help you come next season. So we're going to touch on some of the big news stories this week, including more about that Antonio Brown situation. Then we're going to take an early look at the players that we're targeting in 2019. It is a very early look, but we're going to talk about some of the guys that we like and we're going to try to draft. Uh, Never, never too early to start, folks. Uh, We'll also talk about some of the players that uh, we don't like heading into next season. Some of the players we might be trying to shy away from. And as usual, we're going to wrap things up with players we think are being overlooked. It's the playoff edition, but it is wildcard weekend. So there's a lot going on here. But first, Woods, let's take a look at a couple standout performances from last week and their impact moving forward in our Mighty Moments segment, which is presented by our friends at Subway, whose new Mighty Melts deliver great taste for only $4. And Subway has been kind enough to provide us with some of these melts today. They are delicious, so big thanks to Subway for that. For my guy, I want to shine the light on Lamar Jackson here. He's coming off his best fantasy day of the season, 179 passing yards, 90 rushing yards, two touchdowns, Could have been much bigger, though. He would have had a third touchdown if he'd extended over the goal line on a goal line dive. And then he had a 38-yard score called back due to a penalty. So that would have been the real blow-up game that we've been waiting for from Jackson. And, you know, I think when you look at him, he's really delivered. It's, It's pretty wild how well that he's played down the stretch here. They've only lost one game since he became the starter. Now they're going to get the Chargers. They just played them in Week 16, and he had a decent day in that one. 204 passing yards, 39 rushing yards, and one touchdown. That game was also on the road. We know the Ravens are better at home, especially on defense. I think it's going to be exciting to see what he can do in the playoffs. Woods, who you got? Well, here's a mighty performance for you. DeAndre Hopkins set season highs in catches and targets. 12 catches, 16 targets in Week 17, lining up against the Jaguars and Jalen Ramsey. I mean, this is the best receiver in the NFL. Didn't have a single drop all season. We know the Texans' O-line is honestly garbage, probably the worst in the league. And the Colts, who they're playing in the wildcard round, didn't allow a 100-yard rusher all season. So the Texans know their offense is going to have to go through Hopkins. I think it's time to beast. I, I think it's not out of the question that we're going to see like a 2008 Larry Fitzgerald-esque postseason where Hopkins just like destroys defenses. I like that call. I do. All right, let's bring on today's guest. You're going to remember him from such podcasts as the Week 16 preview episode a couple weeks ago. He did such a great job that we decided to bring him back already. It's the scores, Dan Wilkins. And Wilkins, you are fresh off one of the most random encounters that I've heard about in a while. One of your favorite NFL players came up to you on the street. I'll let you tell the whole story. I don't want to spoil it. I mean, random and the best possible encounter that I could have imagined. Um, yeah, I'm I'm walking home from work at 2 a.m. the other night, and uh, someone in a car dri- driving by that was stuck in traffic yells out to me, go Raiders, and that happens fairly often when you're ra- wearing Raiders gear. There's Raiders fans all over the world, but um, I, I wave, and then he follows it up with, hey, nice beast mode hat, and I say, oh, okay, notice that too. That's cool. And then he calls me over. I was like, okay, this is this is kind of weird. And then all of a sudden, Marshawn Lynch gets out of the car, 
jumps out comes over and gives me a hug and says what's up nice hat i wish i had one and yeah it was was pretty cool definitely unexpected that's wild woods who would who would be your marshawn lynch in that story if that ever happened to you uh oh man that's a good question no one i don't think any nfl player would want to hug me corlin finnegan would probably try to beat me up uh (laughs) I don't, I don't love any NFL team in the way that Wilkins does. And honestly, I would not have believed this story about Marshawn Lynch if we hadn't had a co-worker there at the same time to verify it. So, I mean, it did happen. Uh, good for you, uh, I guess. I was, I was very glad that he was there because I knew that second that no one was going to believe me that that happened. Definitely had... no one believed you, except he has been sort of spotted around our office before. So he obviously knows yeah. someone here and he's uh, in the area. So yeah. I, I don't know which player... Uh, I will go very recent, like I don't know, my man Nick Chubb, who uh, I knew I know, you were going to get a hug yeah. from him. Yeah, <laughs> I feel like we're going to talk about Chubb a lot later in this episode. Um, yeah, that's it's just wild. I mean, the coworker you were with is Mike Dixon from the Score, and he tweeted it out when it happened, and it was fairly late. It was you know like two o'clock in the morning or something. I saw the tweet. I didn't really believe it at the time. I messaged you and you called me right away. You were so <laughs> excited on the phone. It was awesome. I think that's, I'm not a big celebrity guy, but that's one of the only famous people that I could run into and be like, oh my God, it's Marshawn Lynch. So, well, and yeah. it's, yeah, it's just a very Marshawn Lynch story, right? Yeah. Like that's just the kind of guy he is. Great. Uh, unfortunately for the Raiders, they were making headlines for all the wrong reasons this season, traded away two of their biggest stars. And we talked about it a little bit off the top there. Might we see some more trades here? Is it possible the Steelers could be the next ones to trade away a big star? You know, we thought that Antonio Brown sat out in the finale because of an injury. It turns out he kind of freaked out in practice, threw the ball to teammates, that's what reports are saying, and he skipped the rest of the week, showed up to play on Sunday, but they didn't let him. You know, very strange situation here. He reportedly asked for a trade that was thrown out there. And then another report came out saying it was just venting. You know, the cap hit that the Steelers would take on this one would be massive. So it's hard to imagine them actually trading him here. But what do you guys think the most likely outcome here? Wilkie, we'll throw it to you first. Just give us your thoughts in general, I guess, on the situation. And what do you think is actually going to happen in this one? I mean, it seems ridiculous, the idea of trading Antonio Brown. He's still a top three receiver in the league at worst. Um, And it's a huge dead money hit to trade him. I believe it's upwards of $21 million. But at the same time, that's $21 million in dead money this year, and then he's off the books. That also means that they don't have to pay any of the cash that they owe him either. That's just a cap hit. Um, Again, it seems crazy, and we're talking about a top top three receiver in football, but at the same time, that means that the offers coming in may be enough to sway the Steelers. It's not going to be like it was a couple of years ago when they traded Santonio Holmes. They got sick of him, moved him out for a mid to late pick. Maybe it was a fifth. I can't remember exactly, but that's not going to be the situation this time around. If they get offers for including a first round pick for a 31 year old wide receiver, he's going to be 31 next summer. Maybe you consider it if it's getting this bad. Well, we saw, we've seen some players around the league commenting on social media i know i saw george kittle commenting that he'd like to see brown come and brown responded to it Uh, woods do you think there's any chance this could happen uh not much of one it's not unprecedented for the steelers to sort of say you're too much of a headache we're going to ship you out of town i mean that kind of happened with mike wallace when they gave brown that first deal with the team where wallace wanted a bunch of money and they sort of said no we're just going to move on to this younger guy who we like a little bit more and that turned into Antonio Brown it was a good move and now maybe it's time to ship him out I I think another team would say yeah this guy's too much of a headache get him out of town and we can probably get a pretty decent return even though I mean Brown's not a young receiver I I don't think you're getting like multiple first round picks or anything for this guy despite how good he is but that's just just not the way the Steelers do business to to ship stars out of town like that I mean it's not the way that, that that intelligent teams run things and Mike Tomlin isn't the Steelers head coach because he's like some football tactician genius far from it i think mike tom is the head coach because he's able to hold that team of like very disparate personalities for the most part together it should have fallen apart by now probably the Le'Veon bell stuff's been simmering for years i mean he's wanted money who talked holdout and then you know obviously things went really south this year Ben Roethlisberger, I mean, there's always drama around Ben Roethlisberger. He's talking about, oh, I want, I, I might retire, sort of fishing for, you know, the organization to come out and say, no, Ben, you're a legend, don't, don't retire. And, you know, milking the drama out, out of every injury. That's just kind of what he is. Like, drama surrounds Ben Roethlisberger. And obviously the off-field stuff early in his career was, was a problem for the team, too. That's largely gone away. But it's just, they, the Steelers have held it together, and this team sort of stays in contention. Now, they lose more games than they should in the second half of seasons. They've missed the playoffs more than they should have under Tomlin. 
And those things probably wouldn't have happened if Tomlin was a tactical genius of some sort or, or just an, another level higher in terms of you know football X's and O's head coaching. But Tomlin's not going to get fired this offseason, it, it certainly doesn't look like, because the, the Roonies, the Steelers' owners, just don't operate in those ways. They're very loyal. I think the Steelers are going to show loyalty to Brown, and they're going to say this is one of the best players in the league. We're a much worse team without him. No, no matter what we get back in draft picks, we're not going to be able to turn it around fast enough to maximize this window, which is the Ben Roethlisberger window. And I think they're just going to sort of let things simmer, settle down, and we're going to sort of hear the stories of, you know, maybe... Ben gives Brown a call later in the offseason and things are a little smoother and they show up to mini camp and they're smiling together and we get a photo and it's just like they eventually get back to a working relationship and then maybe it all falls apart again in 2019 but I just I, I don't see it happening and with the 21 million dead money charge I think that's just not that tenable of a team to trade anyhow even if they really wanted to trade Brown I think it would be pretty difficult to eat that charge so I think it's going to be just status quo for the Steelers and you know everybody circle back in a few months and maybe things will will be more back to normal yeah I have a really hard time believing that they're they're going to move him at all the other big story of the week has just been the coaching carousel there's been so many rumors I'm not going to run through all of them here but we have eight openings and a couple of them are really enticing I mean the Browns the Packers there's some teams out there that could really make noise next year if they make the right hire looking at it from a fantasy standpoint though Wilkins I'll go to you again here do any of the coaching rumors that you've heard excite you or worry you about next season for any players on those teams? I mean, after a couple of years of fantasy owners and just general football fans alike being extremely frustrated with what was going on in, with the Green Bay offense, it's pretty encouraging to hear them linked to Josh McDaniels. I don't know how the whole personality thing would mesh with him and Aaron Rodgers, but we know that schematically speaking, that would be a huge upgrade and that would help to get the most out of the latter stages of his career. Um, Honestly, anywhere that Cliff Kingsbury ends up, if he ends up coming to the NFL, would be very exciting about the offense that he's coaching. Um, it looks like he's so far scheduled to interview with the Cardinals and Jets. Um, I'd be a lot more excited about the futures of Josh Rosen and Sam Darnold if he's the one leading the way in those two places. Yeah, I mean, for me, I'm more worried about some of these. Like, you seem to have some excitement there. I agree with you about the Packers thing. Positivity. I'm looking at it, looking, you know, a guy like Mike McCarthy. I don't want him anywhere near any running backs that I like. We went through this with Aaron Jones this year. I just don't want to see the same thing happen to, you know, a guy like Nick Chubb. And there we go. We brought him up again. It's probably not the last time he'll come up today, but... You know, if he went to Cleveland, I would be extremely worried that, you know, could we all of a sudden see Duke Johnson start to play more? You know, we just don't know what could happen there. Not necessarily going to have the same situation go down, but it would be a little bit worrisome to me for Chubb's value. I also think people give Adam Gase a hard time, but I think he was handcuffed by his quarterback in Miami. I think if he lands somewhere with a good quarterback, he could win some people back over. Uh, overall, really my thought on it is just it's pretty disappointing to see there's the same names showing up I, I don't know why even with the coordinators I mean how many times do we need to see Daryl Bevel disappoint right or, or even worse I mean the talk that Hugh Jackson's gonna interview for the Bengals job that would be absolutely insane I mean if Mike Brown hired Hugh Jackson for that job I think the NFL should step in and take that franchise away from him that is just a crazy hire if that were to happen Woods you got any thoughts on this any worries or any excitement maybe be positive like Wilkins um, uh, my thoughts are similar. I'm not terrified of retread coaches as much as I used to be. I think we've sort of seen in recent years, you know, sometimes a guy just gets in the right situation. I mean, North Turner in Carolina this year, everybody thought that was a bad hire. And until Cam Newton hurt his shoulder, it was it looked pretty good. And, you know, Brian Schottenheimer was better than anyone thought he possibly would have been this season. So it, I don't think it's like death if Daryl Bevel gets hired somewhere like Atlanta. And, and that, that doesn't necessarily mean bad things for that offense. But, yeah, the, the sexier names are the Cliff Kingsburys and, you know, if you really want to dig deep, like Todd Monk and or some, someone like that you can talk yourself into. This is a fresh, innovative offensive voice, and you could get excited about that hire. Um, I don't think I'll be excited about Mike McCarthy wherever he goes. I mean, keep him away from the young quarterbacks. Keep him away from Baker Mayfield. Keep him away from Sam Darnold. Give those guys someone else. I, I just – I maybe I'm wrong here, but I, I don't have faith that Mike McCarthy is a good coach. And some of the things we've heard since he got fired, like – 
Uh, Jeff Saturday, former Packers center, was with the team for one year, said, you know, they're still running the same plays that they ran when I was here. It's the same offense. I, I think he needs to take a year off. McCarthy, I'm saying and maybe just readjust to uh, the offense in 2019. I don't want him to just install his system for Baker Mayfield and Nick Chubb. I think that would be a disaster. And yeah, Hugh Jackson shouldn't coach anywhere. And it looks like he's a serious candidate in Cincinnati, which would be probably pretty bad news for A.J. Green and Joe Mixon and those guys. Well, we're going to talk more about this, obviously, as the jobs get filled. And we'll go over each hire and how it's going to impact the players on those teams. I really hope that we don't have to talk about Hugh Jackson during that stretch. But I look forward to it over the next few weeks. It's a pretty exciting time when those jobs do start to get filled. I'm also looking forward to the first edition of my 2019 fantasy rankings going up later this week at the score. And instead of me just sitting here and rattling off my rankings... I thought it would be better to give you guys an opportunity. We can all throw out some of the names that we like at each position. We can go around and we'll go position by position here. But heading into 2019, some of the guys that we're going to try to draft and try to get on the majority of our teams, you know, especially with the regular season just having ended, everything's still fresh in our minds. I think sometimes in the off season, you know, it can get lost. You look at the guy's stats over, you know, the full season. We were talking about a guy like Derrick Henry where his stats for the whole year now look okay, but we all know that that really all came in the final month. So it sort of changes the way that you look at it. And, you know, if you're someone that just checks out during the off season, comes back around in, you know, July or August, you might not remember that that happened that way. You might not go in and look at every box score. So uh, let's go position by position here. Let's start with quarterback. Wilkins, I'll give you the floor. Uh, quarterbacks, I'm looking to all the young guys. Uh, my strategy for quarterbacks, as you guys know, having played in so many leagues together, is always just to wait, be one of the last persons to take a guy. I've got Baker Mayfield down here. I don't know that he would be, you know, like that 12th round guy that you can get, but towards the end of the draft, I'm looking to capitalize on the value. And I like Baker Mayfield, Lamar Jackson, like those guys have incredible upside. Um, and I think that one of those guys you can get right at the end if you're the last guy to take a starting quarterback is probably Carson Wentz. Um, People are going to be a little down on him after this year. Uh, He wasn't great after coming back from the ACL. Uh, He got hurt again, but that Eagles offense did start to come together once other pieces started to get healthy. It wasn't just that Nick Foles was coming in for Wentz. I know that that's what we'll talk about a lot, especially if Foles leads the Eagles on a playoff run, but Carson Wentz is the guy there, um, and I think he's got a ton of upside moving forward. I really like the Wentz call. He's going to be one of my top guys. I know that, you know, everyone's going to be looking to someone like Patrick Mahomes. I just think Mahomes is going to go so early in drafts that guys like us, we're never going to get him, right? We're not going to take him in the first or second. And I really think that's where he's going to end up going after this season. Wentz I love because if you look at it, he was playing pretty well, at least fantasy numbers wise. He was putting up decent numbers, borderline QB1, and he wasn't healthy this year. And the biggest area that impacted him was running the ball. He just wasn't running the ball as much this season. I think next year we see him healthy. He is still a huge talent, so definitely don't underestimate him. And when, you know, other guys like you mentioned, I'll reiterate some of them, but Baker Mayfield for sure. I love that that deeper range of younger passers. Lamar Jackson, Mitch Trubisky I'll throw in there. Even Josh Allen, once again, never thought that we'd be saying that. But Josh Allen, a guy who put up great fantasy numbers this year, mostly because of his rushing ability. And all those young guys that I just named, you know, Mayfield and Jackson and Trubisky and Allen, all those guys can run and lift their fantasy numbers up, which has become huge the last couple of years. I have similar guys, and I actually think this is going to become a bit of a group think thing in fantasy circles this offseason that it's like so easy to wait for Baker Mayfield, Lamar Jackson, Josh Allen, those guys after, you know, the, the Phillip Rivers and the Matt Ryans all get drafted. I, I think we might actually some, see some of those guys get bumped up above that type of guy just because everybody's thinking this is the year to wait for the next Patrick Mahomes, the next young quarterback who's about to break out. I think you could even potentially go wait until all those guys go and if you want to wait super late and look at someone like Sam Donald who could take a big step in his second year but maybe you want to flip it around this year I, I, I'll need to do some more thinking on this but I wonder if you can find a value in like an Aaron Rodgers someone who's getting a new coach and who people are pretty down on after this year like if he's only a round or two cheaper than he really should go like that this might be the year where it does make some sense to jump in a little earlier for a quarterback like that there's just so many good quarterbacks when you look at the rankings. It's just so deep that I I would still have a hard time spending up. Like 
I think, you know, Rodgers, there's still that name value. Uh, Deshaun Watson, all those guys are still going to go pretty early and earlier than I'm willing to go. Uh, at running back, I'll take the lead here. Uh, Melvin Gordon's a guy, this is really going to depend. We're going to talk about a lot of guys here. Melvin Gordon's someone that I think is potentially still going to be underrated heading into next season. And it's going to depend where you're picking in the first round, obviously. If you're picking, you know, in the middle to late first round, I think that's where Gordon's going to end up, strangely enough. And I think part of the reason for that is going to be the injury that he had late in the year that's going to knock down his overall numbers. It's going to make people, you know, a little more weary of spending up to get him. But really, other than Todd Gurley, before that injury, Gordon was, I'd say, probably the second best running back, maybe the third best running back. It's It seems very strange, but as far as average fantasy points per game, he was second in standard leagues behind Gurley. He was third behind Gurley and Barkley in PPR. So he's a guy that I think deserves to be top three, top four at the lowest. Um, and I think he's going to fall out of that range for a variety of reasons. I'll be the first one to bring up Aaron Jones. Not surprising at all to hear me say that, but I think the coaching staff change should really help him there. I would have to think that a new coaching staff is going to come in and recognize the talent. Woods, I know you said your piece about this a couple weeks ago, suggesting that maybe a new coaching staff won't fall in love with him, but the talent is there. We've seen him deliver every opportunity he's gotten, and I really would have to think that the new staff is going to jump on that. I see him as a high-end RB2 just behind guys like Nick Chubb, who I'm sure, Woods, you probably want to talk about right now. I'm not going to talk about Nick Chubb because I think he's going to be a first-round pick. And, I mean, I, I could say I'd love to draft him, and I, I will. But that doesn't help owners a whole lot. So I'll go back to carry on Johnson here. Uh, I think he's just going to come at a discount purely because of the injury, which is not going to be a long-term injury. Supposedly, he's almost healthy. Like, if the Lions were in the playoffs, I think he said he could have played. So whole offseason to get better. And, and you know, LeGarrette Blunt's not going to be back in Detroit. And they're going to look at his awful production this season and say, why did we waste all those carries? I mean, the Lions coaches aren't idiots. Karrion Johnson is going to get more of the ball in his second season, and he'll probably stay healthy. I mean, it was a freak knee injury, and, you know, running backs, that happens to running backs. So I think if you can get Karrion Johnson in, I don't know, like the, the fourth round, it, it's hard to project his ADP at this point, but as good as he looked in the bits that we saw him this season, if you project that, a larger workload over a whole season, you're getting a real value in even in, like, the fourth round. Well, when you're talking about somebody coming back from injury, there's another guy I want to mention, and he might be one of my favorite guys to target next year. We'll see how things shake out, but... It's Marlon Mack. When he finally came back from injury in week six, we saw the best version of him we've ever seen. And obviously it helped that Andrew Luck was back. That definitely was huge. But the biggest difference was the improvement to that offensive line. And make no mistake, at this point, the Colts are the new Cowboys in that sense. They have built that lineup. It's incredibly strong at this point. And we saw when it was healthy, that running game was just rolling. Uh, you know, I think, you know, Mac was a top 10 back in all fantasy formats, you know, from week six until the end of the season when he came back from that injury. I like him as a high end RB2 next year. I think he even has RB1 upside. I'll also throw out before I give it to you, Wilkie, just some deeper guys, uh, Kenneth Dixon, uh, Damian Williams. I think they're going to go later in drafts, and I think they have legitimate paths to get to the top spot on their teams, and that could turn out to huge fantasy value if they do. Uh, the first guy I'll throw out there is uh, David Johnson. Uh, obviously, huge name over the past two years, but he didn't have a great year this season, and with how many young running backs emerged, uh, you guys would know better than me, but I mean, he's probably a second round pick next year at this point. I would at, say so. At I the earliest? He, I would say he fall depending who ends up there as the coach, I would say he's going to fall to the second, yeah. Yeah, so honestly, it's it's the same talent we've always seen. I attribute his this past season to just a horrendous offense that, you know, if he, you know, I'll go back to the coaching connection that we had before, but if Cliff Kingsbury ends up there, that's a huge upgrade for not just Josh Rosen, but for David Johnson too. Um so if you can get someone, someone like him in the second round who was in the mix for the top three picks this past year, it's the same guy he's always been. I think that would be a huge value. And uh, I'll also throw out Sonny Michel. Uh, he's been a really nice piece for the Patriots this year. Um, and I think moving forward with what we've seen from Tom Brady, you, you'll kind of see a shift in that offense to uh, kind of lean on the running game a little bit more than it has. Uh, Michel's proven capable of being the workhorse there and once he gets fully healthy going into next year I think he's going to be a top running back my only worry with him I really like him too my only worry is they just didn't seem interested in using him in the passing game at all and I know you know James White's there and you know he plays that role quite a bit but 
I don't know. When I'm looking at the top backs, I I have a hard time putting him too high just based on the fact that he doesn't sort of have that safety net of all the, the receiving yardage that can come that some of the other top backs have. Let's move over to receivers. Uh, Woods, I'll let you go first on this one. Uh, I wrote down Chris Godwin. It's just going to be – it's a starting job for him now. Deshaun Jackson's not going to be there anymore. I think we all believe in Chris Godwin's talent. I think new coach there probably means – you know, good things. It, it it probably won't be worse. That that was a good offense last season, though. So that's not a guarantee that you're going to get an uptick from a new coach. But I think the the new coach will see Chris Godwin and say this guy needs to get a lot of the ball. I mean, he's not that much worse talent wise than Mike Evans, who gets a ton of the ball. So I think that's going to be another strong passing attack. And Godwin is a player I'll be targeting. Fair enough, Wilkie. Who you got at receiver? Uh, I've got a few. Uh, Kenny Galladay, just in terms of opportunity, I mean, he's got number one receiver written all over him uh, going into next year. It'll be his third year. Uh, he's going to be the centerpiece of that passing game. Uh, I fully expect him to run with that. Another now former Lion, I actually really like Golden Tate looking forward. Um, it obviously depends on where he ends up as a free agent, but something about him just says Patriots to me. Uh, you know, the receivers, the receiver group isn't in great shape now that uh, Josh Gordon suspended again. Um, he fits that mold and you know I don't know how long Julian Edelman's gonna last but Golden Tate is that slot receiver that could dominate a Patriots offense again depends on where he ends up so we're not picking today anyway Um, but I'll also throw Mike Evans out there for the same reason I threw David Johnson out I think he's kind of fallen behind in the eyes of many just because of how many other young receivers have emerged he's probably a second like a late second guy at this point looking ahead to next year but he quietly had a huge season um He's one of the best vertical receivers in the game. His 17.7 yards per catch was better than Tyreek Hill, and he went for a career-high 1,524 yards this year. I mean, I I think that he's probably a, a late first-round production that you're getting in the late second or later. Well, I think you guys are going to laugh for mine because they're, they're two receivers that – I picked up late in the season in our league together, in our main league, that uh, that I ended up winning. Woods, you weren't here. I wasn't able to brag about that when you were you were off last week. Um, the first is Robbie Anderson, and he was a big reason why I ended up winning the title in that league. Down the stretch was just a beast. Finished the year with wide receiver three numbers, but from week 14 to week 16 in the fantasy playoffs, he put up more fantasy points than any other receiver in the NFL. I don't think that's going to continue, but Sam Darnold, you know, definitely was establishing a connection with him, especially when he was scrambling. He was finding Anderson uh, late in the year during that stretch. And Anderson was a top 20 guy in 2017 for fantasy. I think he's got a good shot to get back and put up wide receiver two numbers next year. The other guy I'm going to mention, Mike Williams. And I'm not just bringing it up, Woods, because you dropped him. I know I give you a hard time about that. But Tyrell Williams is a free agent, and I think that's just going to open up work for Mike Williams here. Now, I know Hunter Henry's probably going to be back, so that could just offset the Tyrell Williams leaving town if he does leave in free agency. But Mike Williams flashed what he's capable at times this year, and I expect he's going to consistently enter the wide receiver three conversation. We've seen it's touchdown upside. There's a lot going from there. And also, it's built in that you know if Keenan Allen were to go down with an injury, Williams could be a wide receiver one in fantasy at that point. We saw the game that Allen went out. Williams just went off in that game this year. So he's another guy that I think is going to take a step forward next season. Some deeper guys as well, Robert Foster, Antonio Callaway. They're guys that I'm going to target later in drafts. We saw both of them pop for some big games this season, and they're both playing with rookie quarterbacks this year. So a little more experience, a little more seasoning next season, and I think they could emerge even more. At tight end, Wilkins, you can go first. Uh, I'm going to start with a really obvious one and George Kittle. I also want to throw it out there just because, unfortunately for you guys, I have him as a 12th round keeper in our league, so (laughs) sorry about that. But, I mean, in the tight end landscape, it's really hard to get a good one. Uh, Boone, you and I were talking about this earlier, but if you don't have one of the best ones, you find yourself in a position where you're streaming. I think George Kittle is probably the best tight end in the league outside of – Travis Kelsey and he may even just be the best already um I would pay up to get him if I didn't already have him but fortunately again I do um and another guy Evan Ingram uh you know it's the same kind of thing as I was talking about with David Johnson except his tough year was more a result of injuries than anything else I think he comes back next year and is uh huge for that Giants offense um 
he's basically a receiver playing tight end. Like that, that's tough to find. So I I would definitely capitalize on the value where Ingram's at, and you won't have to pick him too high. I'll uh, probably try to draft Hunter Henry. It's going to be an interesting one because he's coming back this week. Apparently, we're going to see him uh, in a game soon. Uh, coming off ACL surgery an injury that happened i think seven months ago it's not very common for a player to return within the same calendar year uh, for an acl injury and he's doing it so we're going to get a little bit of a peek at what he's capable of this year i don't think he's going to look great because you know he's been seven months removed from acl surgery i think he's going to be used by the chargers in like you know some packages maybe around the goal line you know uh, stuff where he probably doesn't have to really dig in and block and, and put a, a lot of pressure on that knee but i really like hunter henry the talent i was very excited about him in 2018 and pretty sad when he got hurt and i love picking up guys coming off injuries because you get them at a discount and and we can project him to be fully healthy assuming he makes it through this year's playoffs without re-injuring that knee i mean he'll be very removed from that injury by the time next season starts so if you can get him at a discount and and i believe in that talent and that passing attack i really like hunter henry yeah henry's definitely on my list i mean i'm cheating a bit for this question because last week uh, i did the podcast on the fantasy mvps for 2018 and near the end i sort of ended up having this conversation by myself just talking about how i'm going to approach tight end next season and i'll just reiterate a little bit of what i said there you know kelsey Ertz, kittle and maybe eric ebron are in my mind the top guys next season And I think similar to what we said about Mahomes earlier, I think all those guys are going to go really early. And this is one of the things that Wilkins and I were talking about before the podcast is so many people struggled this year to find consistency at tight end. I think that's just going to inflate the value of those top guys. Because when you look at somebody uh, like a Kelsey, his stats this year would be the wide receiver eight on the season. Like that's just incredible, incredible numbers to get from your tight end position. So I think maybe Kittle or Ebron could fall a little bit to a point where I would go grab them. Uh, But I'll definitely be looking at guys like Hunter Henry and OJ Howard, another one that's coming off of injury. They're still young, ton of upside, and they're likely going to be available in the mid to, to later rounds of drafts. And I'll also mention Chris Herndon, somebody I talked about a lot down the stretch here. I'm going to be trying to grab him in a lot of drafts. I've talked about him a bunch. He was the tight end seven from week six on and very, very quietly did that um, and did it all as a rookie. And along the lines of what I said with uh, Robbie Anderson, Sam Darnold, going to be more experienced next year. And I think Herndon's just going to advance with him there. So it's I think he's a guy who is definitely going to step up next season and could jump into the fantasy conversation as a tight end one. Uh, we won't need to spend as much time on this question, so we don't have to go around for each position or anything like that. But I want to talk about a few guys that maybe we're looking to avoid next year. It's, once again, very early. A lot could change in the off season. But, Wilkie, is there anyone that you just will not touch next season? Um, I, we don't know that he's gonna if he's going to come back or if he's going to play again. But, like, Rob Gronkowski is just at the point. Just watching him run, it just looks painful. There, There's nothing really to like there. He, he's going to be the a guy just for name value. He's going to go higher than he should. So I want nothing to do with that. Uh, Woods, you mentioned before, uh, Leonard Fournette's probably going to end up getting traded. Uh, that's for good reason, based on what he's done in Jacksonville so far. I want nothing to do with him. And I'll also throw out Cam Newton. Um, you know, I can see, envision a scenario where the Panthers go and land another receiver this season. Uh, we talk ourselves into how good the North Turner offense looked when Cam was healthy at the beginning of the year. But he just looked rough towards the end of the year. I mean... It, He's taken such a beating as a guy who runs the ball very often. I I just want to see him do it again healthy before I gamble on it. Well, I'll I'll reiterate your Rob Gronkowski thing. We've talked about this in the podcast before. I still think there's a chance he could retire this offseason. We're just seeing him fade away a little bit here. And I don't have much faith that he's going to come back healthy next season. I think this is just him breaking down. And Fournette, for sure, another guy that just all those lower body injuries – you just can't trust them in your lineup anymore this season. Woods? Uh, I bet you guys would agree with this, and everyone will agree with it, but I'm just not going to draft Patrick Mahomes. He's going to get drafted too early. It's too easy to find a quarterback later. And also, there's just sort of the idea, you know, there's so much turnover in the NFL. Don't buy high on a guy coming off an MVP season. I, Cam Newton had a huge season. Everyone would have said he's the number one quarterback the next year. Didn't do anything close to the same season the next year. Matt, Matt Ryan was the MVP, and he didn't look like the same guy the next year. Things just come back down to earth that regression is real things stabilize i think 
Patrick Mahomes is likely to remain one of the very best quarterbacks in the league. I don't think he's going to throw 50 touchdowns again. And even if he does, I'll just trust that I can find you know, a quarterback who's 80% as valuable as Mahomes in a round that's way later in the draft. What about Le'Veon Bell? I mean, things could maybe change depending on his landing spot, but I just don't like the idea of investing in a player that sat out the whole season. I know how talented he is, and I know he could end up somewhere where they're going to feed him the ball, but I think I'm going to err on the side of just not taking him anywhere and let someone else deal with that. I feel like a guy who sat out a year could be at a heightened chance of getting an injury when he comes back. Like He's going to have a whole offseason, presumably, with a new team, but not someone that I want to invest in. And this one might be a little bit obvious, but I'll say it as a Bills fan. LaShawn McCoy, just I wouldn't go anywhere near him next year. There's probably going to be a little more excitement about that Bills offense. Going to this season, everyone was so down on that Bills offense, but Josh Allen really kickstarted a little bit late in the year. Um, I just I don't think there's any reason to get excited about the running back position in Buffalo, though, just because Allen's taking so much of the work away from him, especially around the goal line. And McCoy's just getting older here, so no reason to draft him anywhere. We'll wrap things up as we always do. We're going to look at players that are being overlooked heading into wildcard weekend. And this is more of a slant towards DFS, obviously. People are still playing daily fantasy during the playoffs here. So let's see if we can give them a couple players that are going to have big days that maybe people aren't expecting it from them. Wilkie? Uh, I'll start with Austin Eckler. Uh, I mentioned, mentioned this against or ahead of their Week 16 game against the Ravens defense that that defense doesn't give you a whole lot of time to let plays develop down the field there's not going to be a ton of opportunities for Mike Williams and Tyrell Williams in this case just like there wasn't in week 16 so there's plenty of potential for running back targets and receptions Um, Melvin Gordon was back in action that week but it was Justin Jackson taking on an expanded role in place of Eckler who led the Chargers in targets with 10 10 targets and seven receptions Um, now that he's back healthy I'd expect Eckler to have a similar if not better production this week I would look for some guys from the Bears passing attack. I think, you know, everyone looks at this Bears team entering the playoffs like, oh, really good defense. They could go far in the playoffs. Well, they're playing the Eagles this week. That's not a great secondary. They're still pretty hurt, and I'm not sure that the Bears are going to be able to run the ball on them. So I think they're going to have to pass, and I think Trubisky, Allen Robinson, maybe a stack of those guys is fairly inexpensive in DFS and allows you to get in, you know, other studs like DeAndre Hopkins and that sort of guy. Good stuff. I have two... Kenneth Dixon is the first one coming off his best game of the year, 119 yards from scrimmage. He's not playing as many snaps as Gus Edwards is, but he outtouched him last week and with so much rushing production in that offense, I think Dixon is a solid play against the Chargers. And Nelson Aguilar is the other one. The Bears are great against the run, but they can be susceptible to the pass at times. And Aguilar's picked it up the last couple weeks here, had 156 yards and three scores over his last two games. He's a dart throw. He definitely is a dart throw, but one I think could pay off in the wild card round. That's all for today's episode. Wilkie, I appreciate you making time for us again. Probably would have rather been hanging out with Marshawn Lynch today, obviously, (laughs) but you picked the right day to be here. I mean, we have the delicious melt, so it's a nice bonus. I really appreciate you coming on. Thanks for having me. Woods, I probably don't thank you enough i don't even know if you listened to last week's episode but i, I did, did I, I did say i, I did say a nice thank you to you on that one but i know you have a busy schedule as well so it always you know it isn't always easy finding time to do the podcast so it's much appreciated and for everyone out there I, you know i hope you're already following woods on twitter but if not he's at david p woods Make sure you subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, Anchor, whatever podcast platform you're using. And make sure you're checking out my early 2019 fantasy rankings that are going to go up in a couple days here. And I'll also be tweeting them out from at Justin Boone. Big thanks to Wilkins. Big thanks to everybody out there for listening. And we'll see you next time. Said leave on time, my baby said leave